At the beginning of his book, uh, the author, his name is Greg Ogden, he asks the question, what should be the focus of our life each day and all of our days? What should be the focus of our lives? Love of God. There you go. There you go. His response was that in response to God's invitation to enter a relationship of covenant love, we are called to return that love to God by placing our full affection on Him. We are called to return that love to God by placing our full affection on Him. That's a great statement and one that I want to talk about with you this Sunday and next Sunday. What does it mean to place our full affection on God? What does it mean to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves? You've heard that before. You have listened to sermons on that before. But I hope I can give you something a little bit new here that will kind of explore what it means to love God, especially today with all of our hearts. So I want to read God's Word to you this morning. We'll pray and then we'll uh, we'll follow up here. Mark 12, 28 to 34. It says this, And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him um, any more questions. Let's pray. And then that will go. Father, uh, very, very interesting conversation Jesus has with this scribe. He makes a point. And Lord, I pray that we won't miss that point today. What it means, Lord, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love our neighbor as ourselves. We've heard that, Lord, perhaps often. We may be familiar with that. And yet, Lord, uh, it's that very familiarity that sometimes can dull us from hearing it again and having receptive ears. And so, Lord, may we incline our ears to you today. And may you teach us again, Lord, uh, your truths from your word. Lord, this I pray in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the scene is this. Jesus is arguing with a group of people called Sadducees. Okay? There were two major religious groups in Jesus' day. One was called the Pharisees and the other was called Sadducees. Sadducees were religious leaders. They concerned themselves with the temple of God. They were very wealthy, very rich, called aristocrats. And we are told just a few verses earlier that they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe that it was possible for anybody to be resurrected from the dead. Jesus is in an argument with this group of Sadducees when a scribe comes up and hears what's going on. What's a scribe? A scribe was probably the, one of the highest people who was a part of the, the synagogue of Jesus' day. Sadducees were in the temple. Scribes were in the synagogue. 
And this scribe was an expert in Jewish law. He was a theologian. He loved the Word of God. He could memorize the Word of God. He could quote the Word of God. He could teach the Word of God. One of the things they did is they were uh, copyists. So in other words, they would copy word for word for word the Word of God down. So this is a very, very intelligent man who is knowledgeable in the Scriptures, and he comes up to Jesus... And he says, wow, I was really impressed with the way you handled yourself with those Sadducees. I was so impressed by how you dealt with them and how you answered them. So, teacher, I have a question for you. What is the greatest commandment? What is the foremost commandment? You see, Jews all have a lot of laws and commandments. In fact, they counted 613 in all. 613, he says, Teacher, boil it down for me into one commandment. What's the greatest one? What's numero uno? Okay, he wouldn't have said numero uno because he's not Spanish, okay? But you get the idea, right? Okay, what's, what's that one? <clears throat> Love the Lord. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. In essence, Jesus boils life down for us into its very basics. He says that the purpose of living is the adoration of God and the loving of human beings. He says that the focus of life should be to place our full affection on God and to love our neighbors. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? At least it sounds pretty simple. We have a tendency to complicate things. We have a tendency to put our church together and get all our theology in a row. And we have a tendency to do all these things. Those are good things, don't get me wrong. But when it comes right down to it, folks, the purpose of life is to love God, to adore God, and to love each other. And to love our neighbors. I hope I can be simple in how I talk about this today, but what does it mean to love God with all of our hearts? I'm going to give you two things, and I'm going to give you three sub-points under the second thing, okay? The first thing is this. I want to show you point one, is that Jesus starts with God's love for us. Isn't that interesting? I want you to look at verse 29. Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered before he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. He says, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, if you look on the back of your bulletin, this is where you fill out the answers or you draw pictures or funny pictures of me or something. Anyway, look on the back of your bulletin, okay? Look on the back of your bulletin, and you're going to find a word there. And it's pronounced Shema, S-H-E-M-A. Do you see it? You see it? Okay, everybody say that with me, okay? Shema, all right? That's a Hebrew word, okay? It is sometimes pronounced Shema or Shema, okay? So, but I'm going to give you the other, the other direction there. The word Shema is the Hebrew uh, for the first word of Deuteronomy 6.4. Notice Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel. This is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 6 4. He says, Hear. It literally means pay attention. Listen up. You ever say that to your kids? Okay? Pay attention. Listen up. You ever say it to your wife or your husband? Pay attention. Listen up. You know, we have a tendency to be, especially as husbands, ADHD. Anyway, we, we, we tend to be, you know, hard to feel. Pay attention. Listen up. Now, it's hard for me to overstate the importance of this Shema because every pious Jew would recite this verse two times a day. In the morning, they would get up and say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Before they go to bed, they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you walked into the synagogue, 
that verse will be plastered right at the start so you can see it. Later on in Deuteronomy, they talked about phylacteries, and phylactery was kind of a little pouch you could put on forehead or on your wrist. They would have that verse in there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's kind of like our John 3.16 today. For God so loved the world. Everybody knows John 3.16. You've seen it all over. We've got it at the bottom of our bulletin. Sometimes you see it on a cardboard poster in the end zone when a guy's kicking a field goal at an NFL football game. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes. That's kind of like their John 3.16. And my question is, is why would Jesus introduce the idea of loving God with all that we have with this Jewish saying? Why would he bring that there? Well, let me just say right offhand that the Shema contains with it an invitation of grace. In other words, this one God, this singular God, there is no other God, reached down to us, first of all to the Jewish people, and he chose the Jewish people. He established a relationship with them. And he wants to indicate that when Jesus was sent by God to us, he wants to establish a relationship with us. The commandment to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, is a call to respond to a relationship of love that God has first of all established with you and me. To love God with all that we have is not a new hoop that you're asked to jump through in order to be a follower of Christ. You embrace Christ as your Savior and Lord when you repent of sin and when you believe Him as your Savior and Lord. And then because of that wonderful love that He showed by coming and dying for us on the cross, we respond by repenting of sin, trusting Him, and then we have a relationship upon which I can then live out of gratitude and joy for what He has done for me. In other words, God came to us. We repent of sin and believe. We enter in that relationship, and that's only appropriate for me to respond back to Jesus with my heart and soul and mind and strength. Let me see if I can illustrate that for you. You're at a wedding. And I'm standing up there, and I'm standing in front of the bride, in front of the groom, and the groom says looks in the bride's eye and says, you know, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, in sickness and health until death do us part, I promise myself to you. And what does the bride do? She responds back. For sickness and health, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, I promise my life to you. And so when, that's just like what Jesus does. He came to us to love us, to save us. And so my natural response is, God, I got you covered, man. I'm responding back to you. I'm loving you because you love me. Right? So that's what Jesus does when he gives us the Shema. He's trying to establish the fact that God has given us, he has come to us, he chooses us, and we respond back to him with our life of love. <laughs> soul, our heart, and mind to Him. See, God's love for us is the basis of my response to Him in love. <clears throat> so, secondly, loving God with all of our hearts. For us to respond back to God in love, it involves loving God, of course, with all of our heart. And again, I want to ask the question, what does that mean? Because we hear it and it just kind of kind of comes, but what does it mean? Well, I'm going to share three things. And the first thing is this, what is the heart? What is the heart? Well, biologically speaking, the heart is a muscle. It's an organ, and it pumps blood to your body. It's the center of your circulatory system. And I know you're all kind of looking at me going, well, duh. Okay, you're right. That's the organ. That's the muscle. That's the heart. And if the heart stops beating, that's a pretty serious thing. Okay? Now, you and I know that, but biblically, what are we talking about there? Well, the Bible also assumes that it's an organ. But more than that, I want you to know that the word heart occurs over 900 times in the Bible. If anything occurs in the Bible more than 900 times, you know it has to be important. Now in the Bible, the heart is not only that human organ, 
but it, re it represents the center of spiritual activity. It refers primarily to the command center of our being, our mind, our emotions, our will. Now, I want to pick on that word will for a moment. God has made us different from the animals. We can use our wills, whereas animals mainly operate out of instinct. In our wills, we can choose between alternatives. We can choose between good and bad. We can choose between right and wrong. We can choose between loving and not loving. I want you to know that becoming a Christian sometimes is a battle of our wills. When you hear the Word of God preach to you, sometimes our will says, eh, it's no big deal. And sometimes our will says, I've heard it before. Can't you move on? And sometimes our will says, that's not true, Pastor. There is no God. And sometimes our will says, you know, I've never become a Christian. And really, God loves me that much. And so what happens is I surrender my will to the Lord Jesus Christ and I become a follower of Him. But when you come to Christ, a lot of times there's a battle in your will and in your heart. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the whole <coughs> stature, because I have rejected him. And he's talking about Saul. For God sees not as a man sees. For what? Man looks at the outward appearance. What? But God looks at the heart. God is looking at your heart. So the spiritual, the, the heart is the spiritual core, a spiritual center, and God wants us to align our hearts with His heart. Right? He wants our heart to be aligned with His heart. There's a problem, though. And the problem is, is that there is sin in our hearts. And our hearts seek freedom, and we don't want to obey God. And as you look at our culture, as you look at our world today, you look at the world that God intends for His children to dwell in, you realize that we are very, very far from that. We're broken. There's something flawed. There's something wrong with our heart. And even people who are not Christians understand that. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the mental health industry today is more than $80 billion a year. $80 billion a year for the mental health ministry. You know why? Because our hearts are flawed. There's something wrong. And even if you're not a Christian, we understand that there's something going on in our heart. It's a rebellion often against God. So how can we love God back with all of our hearts? If our natural tendency is to rebel against God, how can we do that? Two things. The second thing I'm going to show you today is this. Our hearts need to be broken. And they need to be humble. If you want to love God with all of your heart, then your heart needs to be broken and it needs to be humble. If you are not willing to listen to this, then you'll check out of everything else that I say. Because if your heart is not willing to be humble and not willing to be broken, then you probably won't be loving God very well with your heart. Psalm 51. I've got Psalm 51 up there. King David had sinned with a woman named Bathsheba that committed adultery. You've heard about adultery all this week over the news, haven't you? with General Patea, the traitors. David committed adultery. It took a year before someone called him the carpet on for David. David confessed his sin. Here's what he says. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you, before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned 
and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Create in me a clean heart for God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You think about that for a moment. David was brutally honest with himself. He says, I know my transgressions. I know my sin has ever been ever before. Against you, God, and you alone, I have sinned. Please renew within me a steadfast heart, O oh God. Have you ever been brutally honest about your own heart to God? I was reading a sermon from Mark Driscoll, this week, pastor of Mars Hill Church in, in Seattle. And he was talking about the heart from the book of Proverbs. He says, here's a brief list of what appears just in the book of Proverbs regarding the heart. In Proverbs alone, the heart is the seat of understanding, of learning, of memory, of faith, of obedience. But it's also the seat of rebellion, and planning, and imagination, and lust, and perversity, and deceit, and folly, and anxiety, and hope, and joy, and hurt, and grief, and peace, and wisdom, and happiness, discernment, rage, motives, purity, folly, friendship, gladness, envy. It is the seat of violence, it is the seat of reasoning, and sadness, and evil, and sin, and hardness toward God. That's quite a list, isn't it? That is quite a list what comes out of our hearts. And the heart can be so deceitful, and yet the Bible tells us that God is actually drawn to the heart that is humble and broken. Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, verse 15 says, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with a contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. The Bible says that God draws near to people who have broken and contrite hearts. God is attracted to hearts that are humble. Hearts that are willing to admit they are sinful and they need God. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you want to have a heart that loves God with all your heart, then it's got to start here with a, a humble and broken heart. If you don't have a contractor, if you can't recognize your own sin, you're going to have a hard time loving Him with all of your heart. A person who doesn't understand this says the reason I cheat on my taxes is because they chose on her, did cheat on her taxes. <laughs> the person who does understand it says the reason I cheat on my taxes is because I have a sinful heart. And I need God. The person that doesn't understand that says I cheated on my spouse and the reason I did it is because I was just so lonely and my, my, other sp my, my wife didn't have it and, and everybody else was doing it. The person who understands it says I cheated on my spouse and I did it because I'm sinful. And I need to repent. You see... Broken and humble people realize they have a great capacity to sin and rebel against God. Do you ever pay attention to that? I really have a capacity to sin and rebel against God. A person with a broken heart also has a teachable heart. That person has a heart that's eager to live out the truth of God. Did you hear what I just said? That person is eager to live out the truths of God. Are you eager to live out the truths of God? That's the beginning of having a heart that, that, that loves God with all your heart. And it also means this. Third, our hearts need to be attentive to God. I want to read 
Luke 10, 38 to 42, it's up here. Now as they were traveling along, he, that's Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. <coughs> but Martha was distracted with all her preparation, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you were worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, but shall not be taken away from her. You've all heard that story before, haven't you? Many of us have heard this, and yet, just to be reminded again, Jesus is contrasting the heart of Mary and the heart of Martha. You see Mary's heart? She's described as listening to his word. On the other hand, Martha is described as distracted with all her preparations. Now, Jesus loved them both, of course. But what does Jesus love? He loves a heart that is paying attention to him. He loves an attentive heart. Greg Ogden, in his book, The Essential Commitment, shares this illustration. There was a Native American who was being escorted around the center of it. Manhattan, New York City, by a friend. This friend was a resident of the city. As they're walking on the streets of Manhattan, this Native American stops and whispers to a friend. He says, he says, wait, I hear a cricket. The friend says, yeah, wait, come on. With all the noise of the taxis, with the horns honking, the brakes screeching, and people screaming, how could you possibly hear a cricket? Undaunted, the Native American led his friend to a nearby planter and dug through the mulch, and sure enough, there was the cricket. His friend said, how could you possibly hear a cricket in downtown New York? This Native American replied, he said, my ears are different than yours. It simply depends on what you are trained to listen to. And he said, here, I want to show you. And he pulls out of his pocket a handful of change and throws it on the ground. And immediately, within a block away, everybody stops and listens to the money. <clears throat> what have your ears been trained to listen to? Is the question. What are your ears trained to listen to? A humble heart, a broken heart, a listening heart, an attentive heart. That is what it means to love God with all your heart. A good summary of the goal of our lives would be to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love how Brian Chappell points out. He says, spiritual change is more a matter of what our heart loves than what our hands do. <laughs> so where is the focus of your heart? When you say that you love God with all of your heart, is it humble? Is it broken? Do you understand that you're a sinner, that you need God, His Word to, to guide, direct you? And are you paying attention to His Word? Because we can be a lot like Martha, can't we? So busy and distracted and cooking the turkey and, you know, uh, the stuffing. Now I'm not going to make you feel guilty here tonight. No turkey on the table for anybody this week. I'm listening to God, man. <laughs> but you get the idea, don't you? We'd be so busy. Are we really loving God then with all of our hearts if we've not paid attention? Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, as we come here today, um, I can't see anybody's heart in here. I see what they look like on the outside. They look really good. But you know, Lord, that all of us can look good on the outside, but on the inside, probably. Lord, you want us to align our hearts with you. And while we look at a world that seems to be going very far away, 
God, you call us to have our hearts aligned with yours. So that we, we are willing to hear and willing to do and willing to obey. And so, Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning. And may, may we, Father, just sort of come back again to the, the first and foremost commandment. To love you, God, with all our heart. To be occupied with you. Thank you, God, for these that are here today. Father, there may be someone here today, uh, a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, a child, whatever. And they've never placed their trust in you. Oh, God. I pray you'll speak to their hearts today. They'll be attentive and listen. And they'll want to follow you. We give you thanks, God, for this day and for your word. Lord, be close together with a song.